from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Me with the great voice. Holy moly, it's great to be back in our grill room. Yes, yes. So it's wonderful to be looking at these great windows. And if I look a little different, it's because I have a confession to make. So most of you have known me as a sailor all my life. But recently, I've crossed over to the dark side. With the purchase of this boat, it's official that I'm not just a sailor. So we're gonna have it up here in a couple, in a month or so, and you're all welcome to come for a ride because we intend to just wear it out on San Francisco Bay. So we'll be up here playing around with it, and all those people who said I can only sail are correct because I'll be learning to drive this creature. <laughs> anyway, uh, I spent so much time with Dave McEwen's beautiful duck, Dave and Jen's beautiful duck, I just thought we got to try it ourselves, you know. So let's see. Um, we have some other announcements to make before we get rolling today, too. One of them is uh, there's a great event coming up, the Cruise Fest. And to speak about that event, I want to invite up our uh, esteemed staff commodore, Bruce the Man Monroe. Bruce, come on up and tell us about Cruise Fest. Well, let me add my wonderful thoughts about resuming live Wednesday outing lunches with Ron Young. It's great to be back and it's great to be see so many people back here at our regular table over here. It's full to the brim and uh, I, I see Mark and Noel back there. Guys, management, this is the way to do it. Keep it up. <clears throat> so, with that, I want to announce the Cruiser Group and the Yacht Club is having a new special event tomorrow on the docks. They call it an open house party, but I call it an open dock party. It's, um, there will be member boats there, all festooned, uh, and their best, and their best appearance, and they will be available for boarding. Ron, too bad you don't have your boat out there yet for this event. It would be great, but uh, there will be wine, food, and boats all provided by members. No cost for this event. Uh, it is from 5 to 7 p.m. tomorrow on the docks. And there will be wine, northern Italian wines, poured by prestige wine importers. And this is a Linda Cahill production. She got the wine, so you know it's going to be good. Anything Linda does is done well. Uh, there will be food, drinks, and as a lot of camaraderie, a, a great opportunity to socialize with your fellow yacht members. Um, you don't have to have a boat, of course, and it's members only, but you can bring a guest, but not for non-members. Um, it's a great event, and I encourage everybody to attend. We will be there with our boat princess. Thanks, Bruce. I want to also acknowledge in our crowd today, Staff Commodore Terry Klaus. Terry, thanks for coming to be with us again. Terry was a very significant Commodore back in 2004, uh, created several traditions in our Yacht Club, including the Big Sail. He was the Commodore when we founded the Big Sail and had the insight to see this great event. And also, we wrote the mission statement and, uh, during a uh, Terry's term, he asked me as chairman of Long Reach Planning to write it, and it had everything to do with camaraderie, which we are celebrating here in this room today. So now, many of us, um, how many people saw the movie Master and Commander? And we 
we all loved it. I know we did. Uh, what was amazing about that movie was they had this incredible 18th century replica of a warship. And so it turned out that the bringing of that warship from Newport, Rhode Island to California was a big enough adventure. So our speaker today, who had become an architectural designer and in fact a wooden boat shipwright, I've got to talk to him about my wooden boat youngster over in the Spalding Yard later on. I might even take one to show it to him. Uh, at any rate, he then turned to another skill he had as an author and wrote an incredibly fun and harrowing book that came out yesterday about the tale of bringing that replica all the way 6,600 miles from Newport, Rhode Island to Hollywood. So let's give a warm, smiling, Wednesday yachting lunch and grill room welcome to Will Safford. Will, come on up, buddy. Well, first I want to say thank you. It's such a privilege to be here at St. Francis. I've always looked at this club from afar, and I can't believe I'm here right now, so thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is I'd like to just ask if everyone can hold any questions or comments till I'm done with the presentation. I'm going to make that all possible. It would be easier if I can just get through without any interruption. So here we go. I'm going to tell you guys about a motley crew of sailors who did just about anything and everything we could to get the job done. Now, you see that guy in red up there? That's me. And I know what you're all thinking. You're all wondering if I remember to go to the bathroom before free climbing 60 feet up in the rig in 80 knots of wind. When I was 21 years old, I was hired to sail the American Tall Ship Rose from Newport, Rhode Island to San Diego, California to make the movie Master and Commander starring Russell Crowe. And there you can see our ship over his shoulder. Now, this was a pretty intense journey. We departed from Newport in January to sail through the North Atlantic to Puerto Rico, and that's a terrible time of year to leave Newport. We then continued on through the Caribbean Sea till reaching Panama. We transited the Panama Canal and then continued our journey north along the western seaboard of North America. This is a profile diagram of Rose. She was 180 feet length overall, 130 feet on deck. She had a 30-foot beam, a 15-foot draft, displaced 500 tons of water. She had 17 sails totaling 13,000 square feet of sail area, and the top of her mainmast was 130 feet above the water. So what's it take to sail a ship like Rose? Well, first off, it takes a lot of muscle. The original Rose would have sailed with a crew of around 200 men. We did it with a crew of 30. And yeah, granted, we have electricity, plumbing, engines, but none of these modern amenities helped us with setting or trimming the sails. In order for us to pull this off, we needed great leadership. And that all started with Captain Richard Bailey, who then hired our officers Tony, Andy, and Christina, who were then followed by our bosun, our cook, our engineer, and then finally, our lowly deckhands, of which I was one of them. So how do I fit into this? Well, I grew up in upstate Connecticut and not to a family of sailors, but I loved Popeye, as you can see from this picture. After graduating from high school, I took a path less traveled and enrolled at the International Yacht Restoration School in Newport, Rhode Island, where I learned the craft and art of restoring wooden yachts. I loved it. It was amazing. And when I wasn't at Iris, I was out sailing, which eventually led to me getting paid to fill on, the New on Newport's America's Cup 12-meter fleet. And once I knew I could get paid to sail, I found my calling. Okay. 2001 marked the 150th anniversary of the race that became known as the America's Cup, and I somehow landed a job on Onawa, America's oldest 12-meter yacht, who had long since fallen from grace when Earl McMillan formed a syndicate to restore Onawa. You can see from these pictures that we had a lot of work to do in one year's time, but we pulled it off and got Anima completed in time to ship over to Europe so she could race in England, Italy, Monaco, and France. When I was 21 years old, 
That was my home. I lived on the French Riviera on that boat, and my life was awesome. <laughs> but like all good things, it had to come to an end when the season was over. And I returned back to Newport, homeless and jobless. Now, Newport, Rhode Island, for those that haven't been, is a Gilded Age summer retreat. This is where Jay Leno goes to hide out from the paparazzi these days and where Bob Dylan electrified folk. In the summer, the streets swell with tourists. But come winter, Newport is a barren wasteland. Now, me being 21 years old, I thought that the world revolved around me. I'd come back to Newport, and there'd be some beautiful yacht with a mate's position waiting for me to sail down to the Caribbean, but that wasn't the case. All the spots were filled. There were no opportunities. So Casey, the captain of Monoa, sent me down to Rose to beg for work. All right, well, how did Rose come to be? Well, in 1969, historian John Millar, only 24 years old at the time, commissioned a claims shipbuilding yard, Smith & Rowland of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, to build a replica of the 1757 HMS Rose for the American Bicentennial Celebration. Rose was built for a mere $300,000, equivalent to about $2.4 million today. Despite the skepticism, Millar pulls it off and Rose is delivered to Newport in time for the celebration. Here we see a picture of her docked in Newport's waterfront. And here we see a picture of Rose on a period postcard, but what happens after the bicentennial? Well, there's no plan. So she falls into a terrible state of disrepair and decay, and almost a decade goes by until Connecticut businessman Kay Williams purchases Rose Williams is the owner of the family-owned and operated Captain Cove Seaport, located in Bridgeport, Connecticut. <clears throat> now, Williams gets Rose, puts together a crew, and hires Captain Richard Bailey, hi highlighted here in the bubble. And they rebuild the ship while she's floating in the water from the waterline up. It was an incredible project, but the community came together, and eventually William's goal was achieved when the Rose was certified as America's only Class A sailing school vessel in America. Rose then goes on to serve as an educational platform offering tall ship training opportunities to the general public until being acquired by 20th Century Fox. So, I'm bringing it back to me back in Newport. Well. Rose was the antithesis of all my career ambitions, but I didn't have a choice. Casey told me to ask for Tony, and I don't know, I had these visions of a guy with beard covered in tar and tattoos and a raspy voice, you know, someone that looked like that guy, right? Instead, I meet a young Tom Cruise lookalike who is oddly normal and cool. After talking for a couple of minutes, he invites me down into the ship's interior, and we walk down two flight of steps onto the ship's gun deck. This is the first subdeck. It's kind of like the living room for the crew. This is where everyone eats, has their meals, and the tables that you see, those, that's where the cannons would be mounted. And we're talking, and Tony's asking me questions as we walk up forward, and he brings me up to this small hatch and takes me down to an even smaller compartment. And this is where he offers me a job. For 25 cents and all the salt water I can drink, I can sail to Hollywood to make a movie. <laughs> Tom Rothman is one of the most accomplished men in Hollywood. At the time, he was the co-chairman of 20th Century Fox. Today, Rothman is the chairman and CEO of Sony Motion Picture Groups. He's responsible for movies such as Much Ado About Nothing, Titanic, Avatar, and Tom Rothman loves Patrick O'Brien books. So who's Patrick O'Brien? Well, for starters, he's an English author who claimed to be from Ireland. O'Brien's best known for his 20-book Aubrey Matron series framed around the friendship of Jack Aubrey and Stephen Matron during the Napoleonic Wars. Well, Rothman read all the books, bought the rights to make the movie, and spent a decade trying to figure out how to do it. Enter acclaimed film director Peter Weir, who just recently won an honorary Oscar for his work in movies such as Witness, Dead Poet Society, and The Truman Show. Weir pit, or Rothman pitched Weir the job three times until Weir accepted. With an agreement in place, Weir set off to go find the starship of his movie. 
and he went to Lunenburg, Nova Scotia to find the Rose, the ship that O'Brien himself said <clears throat> was much like the surprise featured in his novels. With his ship secured, Weir got to work writing his script. Okay, I think it's safe to say we all know that I accepted the job. And I move on the first week of November, and the accommodations are pretty spartan to say the least. But fortunately, I was able to persuade my best friend Jared to join the ship with me. I was a little too chicken to go to Lone, to be honest. After moving on the ship, we soon motored the ship over to Newport Shipyard to begin a massive refit to prepare the ship for the journey. First item on the list was repowering the ship. You see these pretty cruddy old engines. So in order to do that, we had to chain lift the engines up out of the engine room. That meant hanging an I-beam from the gun deck. The engines were then wheeled forward and lifted up out of the cargo hatch using a crane. Days later, our new Caterpillar 3406 diesel engines arrive. These ponies are craned and loaded into the ship and set into the engine room. Now, while all this engine work's going on, I, as a ship's carpenter, am tasked with rebuilding the mast partners, which are the structural element where the mast penetrates the deck, and the mast partners prevent the mast from shaking the deck to pieces. Days later, Rose is towed over to the railway so she can be hauled out of the water, and so we can begin the massive amount of underbody work that needs to happen. Scaffolding is built up around the ship. Soon, grinders and caulking irons and mallets are out. New planks are going on. The work list kept growing, and everyone had to pitch in. But fortunately, our officers were aggressively recruiting, recruiting new crew members, and that meant a melting pot of personalities in conflict. And don't get me wrong, my wife will tell you all that my personality is an acquired taste. <laughs> so we had to learn, though, still to put our differences aside, because we were all there for the same mission. Our job was to get the ship ready so that we could sail her to California. And don't get me wrong, it wasn't all that bad. I mean, here we've got Captain Richard Bailey washing his dog in the galley sink. And we've got our Christmas tree lashed to the ship's wheel. But after two months of hard work, we can see the fruition of all of our hard labor coming, to, uh, coming through. Here we see Rose ready to be launched and put back in the water. And soon she floats again. Now, to thank us for all of our hard work, the officers throw a themed costume farewell party. And we have a blast and drink way too much rum. But still lingering is, when are we going to leave? The weather router has said that there is no good weather window. And Fox is pressuring us to get the ship to the West Coast in time to begin production. Well, we departed from Newport on a cold, blustery January afternoon. Here, you see me and Jared having fun smiling, saying goodbye or a final farewell to Newport. Now, the crew was broken up into three watches. Each watch was led by an officer, then followed by an able-bodied seaman and six deckhands. Those not standing watch were the captain and his dog, our cook, the engineer, and our bosun, and then the Hollywood rep. The officers not wanting to miss a minute jump right into conducting safety drills to prepare us to get through operating the ship through the evening. The next morning, hands are sent aloft as we prepare to set the square soles for the first time. All of that time in the yard had conditioned us already how to work together. And within a few minutes, I understood all that was great about sailing a ship like Rose. I was drunk on tall ship sailing. This was incredible. This is still one of the best sunsets I've ever seen in my life. The next day, we crossed the equator. We shed all of our foul weather gear and celebrate as we relax in this calm, tranquil ocean. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Not the equator. The Gulf Stream. <laughs> sorry. Well... <clears throat> We were a little naive to be so relaxed. This 
is the Beaufort wind scale, a, um, a universal gauge that relates wind speed to observed conditions on sea or at land. The forces range from 0 through 12, 12 being classified as 64 plus knots or hurricane conditions. This is a wind barb chart showing a universal representation of wind speed and direction. And you can see that I've highlighted the 75 knot barb. This is a NOAA weather chart from January 14th, 2002. And you can see where I've highlighted the 75 knot barb, exactly where our ship is located. This is what hurricane conditions look like on a ship like Rose. Yep, you see that guy in red? That's me again, after having just inspected our four peak because we were afraid we were gonna sink. We were taking on so much water that the pumps were having a hard time keeping up, but I was 21 and naive and having a blast other than the occasional hand grab. But I can't say that for all of my shipmates. Not everybody had fun. Now, in this shot, our ship does a 60 degree roll. There were a lot of those. Now, I also am sure that everyone here knows that boats aren't quiet when they're sailing. There's actually a lot of noise going on down below. And this was an old wooden ship, and let me tell you, she was screaming from the amount of racking that she was being put through with the wind and the waves. Here, we've got Scott explaining to the camera why the lights are out behind him, because electrical fires started to happen. At this point, the crew was forbidden from sleeping below decks. All of our abandoned ship gear was prepared, and everybody was mostly hanging out up on deck. As the day goes on, the weather continu conditions continue to deteriorate. The seas start to build to 20 to 30 feet. Now, where you're seeing this footage is 20 feet above the water line on the quarter deck. Now, sailing a ship like Rose, it's not like a yacht. You're out there out in the elements. There's no autopilot, there's no dodger. You just have to stand out and take it on deck. And steering the ship was terrible. We had two helmsmen on the wheel at all times and sometimes an officer had to jump in. Here we've got Captain Bailey wedged on the port quarter and you can see how much rolling the ship is doing. But as the day goes on, we acclimate, right? We're sailors. We tell jokes, everyone smiles and laughs. We're having a good time. So John's explaining to the camera that one of our square soles has started to come unfurled and well, for some reason, Tony grabs me and says, hey, Will, why don't you come up aloft? Because the only way that we can deal with the square sole is climbing the rig, because that's how it had to be done on ships like these. So we come back out, and you're gonna see the shot that I opened this presentation with, where there we are, up on the yard arm, trying to take control of that sail. And to me, that was one of the most intimidating things I'd ever done. Free climbing that rig in that storm, and with that amount of rolling that we're doing, we're being tossed 60 feet from side to side every four to five seconds. And then the whole plan is, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to jump on the sail and punch it, like we're trying to wrangle some sort of greased pig. Now, there's gonna be a break in, oh, the, the break has already happened in footage because John peeled off the cover of his camera after a squall line had moved through. And so you don't get to see us wrangle the sail, unfortunately. But after doing that, we tie the gaskets around, which are sail ties, and Tony tells me to go back to deck, and he didn't need to tell me twice. Now, climbing aloft was actually not that bad. I mean, it's, you know, you're looking up at least, but descending the rig in this kind of weather is terrible because you're having, you're hanging out overboard of the ship and you're having to look down at the frothy water. And every time Rose fell off a wave, it felt like we were hitting a brick wall and the entire rig would shake and rattle. Here, we've got Tony coming down a few minutes later. And for him, it's easy. I was winded, but this guy, look at him. It looks like he's taking a walk through a park. I mean. What a hero. Honestly, I would follow this man to hell. We get through the storm, but that's not the case for everyone. Here we see Rose's sister ship, HMS Bounty, sinking in Hurricane Sandy in 2012. 
Of her 16-member crew, two died. One crew member died, and her captain was lost at sea. Well, it's hard to believe that that flag was new five days earlier. And let alone that we were in such a dire situation 24 hours prior. The interior of our ship is destroyed. It looks worse than my daughter's bedroom on a Saturday morning. And all of our toilet paper is soaked. <laughs> well, after some minor sail repairs, we set our square sails again, and we start charging south towards our destination. Days before, this would have seemed like a good amount of wind to me, but now it's just enough to fill our sails. Three days later, we sight land, Puerto Rico, land ho. Hands are sent aloft to furl the square soles and ready the ship. And I am so excited to take on Puerto Rico after having just looked death in the eyes in the North Atlantic. I can't wait for the drinks and the girls and exploring this lush, tropical, beautiful island. And then reality sets in when I realize where we're docking our ship, a half-abandoned ferry terminal that looked like the set from Mil Ma Ma Mad Max. And then, let's add insult to injury. After docking the ships, the officers tell us the long, staggering work list that we need to accomplish before we leave. Rose suffered a, a catastrophic structural failure during the storm. The element highlighted in yellow, our bit, is what supports the bowsprit. Well, that failed. So the bowsprit pushed into the ship, compromising the tension of our rig. We had to slack the rig, push the bowsprit out, then temporarily shore the footing of the bowsprit, reset the bowsprit, retune the rig. Anyone not working on the bowsprit was sent aloft to rig up our highest sails, the Tagalans. We were given a half day off in Puerto Rico, and not wanting to miss a second of that, we all pitched in, got a minivan, and went looking for the beach. And guess what? We got lost. That's right. We sailed to Puerto Rico, and we couldn't find the beach. Here we are asking for directions. But eventually, we find the famed Rincon, and we get to enjoy a few hours of what it feels like to be a normal person on a beach away from the slave-like conditions of Rose. We are now a conditioned crew. When we departed from Newport, I had no idea what was going on. But now, I've got a sense of what I'm doing. I understand what it means to set the sails and how to do it. And I'm having to think less about everything that's happening. So I can sit back and relax a little bit. And everyone in this room knows that that is when everything goes completely wrong. It was about an hour before sunset. And I heard a giant explosion. And all of a sudden, there was a call for all hands up on deck. And I run up and I see the last thing any sailor wants to see. We were dismasted in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. Now, a ship like Rose has three masts, a fore, a main, and a mizzen. And each mast is made up of sections. So the fore and the main have three sections, the lower, the top, and the tagallant. Well, the main tagallant mast exploded, causing the sail to fall forward with the yard, and that caused the fore tagallant yard to snap in half. What also happened was we compromised our main topmast because of that explosion, the top of that was damaged. So you would think that we should strike sail and decrease loads after a something like this happened, but no. If we had struck our topsail, we were afraid that the entire rig actually was going to go over. So I'm up on deck for two, 30 seconds, and guess what? Tony grabs me again and says, hey, Will, go up the main mast and help Andy and Christina. And so you can see me right up there wondering why I'm standing at the top of our broken mast. Here we can see a shot of Tony and our bosun working on the um, four to gallon yard trying to figure out what they're going to do with that mess. Captain Bailey grabs the wheel. It's the only time he ever steered the ship in the entire journey. Now, it's only the officers and myself aloft. The rest of the crew is down on deck on standby waiting for us to give them orders. This is a shot from my perspective looking down. We can see me looking at the second mate, and you can see the fallen spar hanging over the sail. And this is a silhouette shot of Tony cutting away the tagallant on the foremast. Eventually, everyone gets a chance to go aloft. Everybody gets to pitch in, and we work through the night trying to stabilize our rig so we can make it through to the next morning. I really, oh. 
here we are still working, lowering the spars. There wasn't a break in any of the work that we were doing. Everyone had to grind on. And you can see that we were exhausted. Eventually, we arrive in Panama. The Port Atlantic City to the, uh, to the canal is Cologne on the Atlantic side. Fortunately, the owner of our boat has a really big pocketbook. So we were able to call in some favor, a favor from a massive crane to help us with the continued downrigging of the ship. Now, we're tired. We've been dismasted. We've been working relentlessly. The heat index is 125 degrees. Everyone is miserable. But somehow our officers continue to motivate us to work together. But there was a lot of grumbling on board. There was talk about people leaving the ship. And here we see some smiles, I think mostly fake. Since departing from Newport, we'd only been given a half day off in Puerto Rico. In Panama, we were given three hours. I'll tell you, after the first hour, I was ready to leave. So the Panama Canal, for those that don't know, is an artificial 51 mile waterway located at the Isthmus of Panama, connecting the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, dividing North and South America. Fortunately, we were given an evening slot. I welcome the reprieve from the heat and the humidity. Going through the canal means ascending three locks that then bring you into the center of man-made lake, Lake Gotten. You then transit the lake and then go back through three descending locks, which will bring you out into the Pacific. The entire process took us just under eight hours. Once in the Pacific, we motored out and anchored at the Panamanian island of Taboga in the Pacific. Now look at that shot. That's what I wake up to in the morning. What a beautiful scene and setting. And to thank us for all of our work, we get a half day off in Taboga. I was grateful because I got to stand the first watch, which meant I was free for the rest of the day. And as soon as possible, I hopped into a dinghy and went to shore. Now, some of my shipmates, they hung out on the beach. Other people went to the bar. I decided to go hike to the top of the island and see what I could see with a view and take, a great, take some great pictures. But eventually, we all ended up at the same hotel bar that had very cheap pina coladas. The next morning, we depart for Mexico. And Captain Bailey sends two deckhands in our dinghy to film this incredible footage of our dismasted frigate sailing. I am certain this is the only authentic footage of a dismasted frigate under sail. Well, where the Atlantic brought destruction, the Pacific brought boredom, at least for the deckhands. I mean, it was a constant challenge for the, for the officers. What's that saying? Um, idleness is the, the devil's workshop. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. And the officers didn't want to risk that. So they set us to work scraping, tallowing spars, tarring. And it wasn't just us that they had to deal with. It was a sinking crew morale. Then adding to the officer's plate, they had to deal with the, the threat of the famed Tawanapec winds that come down through Chivas Pass. Then after that, there's threats of pirates. So we have this run-in with this Mexican Navy boat, which is an old World War II AUK-class vessel. And we actually seriously talk about arming our cannons with screws and nails. Somehow, we arrive in Acapulco, mostly unscathed, a couple minor breaks, but the morale on the ship has hit rock bottom. And the officers know that they've got to cut us some slack. So we're all given a full day off from the ship. And you can see that really made the difference. With our ship docked, we took on the best that Acapulco had to offer, starting with mechanical bull riding. My favorite was seeing the famed Acapulco cliff divers. And then bombing down around Acapulco with the old, inside of the old fashioned Volkswagen Beetle taxis. Our youngest crew member, only 16, tried bungee jumping for the first time. This is where it all came together for us. We had done all the hard work, but everyone just needed to kind of come together and have a lot of rum and celebrate how far we had gotten. Our journey continues on for 2,000 more miles, and we see water spouts. But it's not just one water spout we see. In this photo, we actually have three water spouts in a row. 
the morale on the ship has eased. Everyone smiles more. We're having more fun. But our ship continues to deteriorate and break. But we see dolphins and even get a little time to read books. We even played a prank on Captain Bailey with a fake fish. But eventually we arrive in San Diego. And like departing Newport, it was a cold, gray day. The mood on the ship is mixed. Some of our crew members are happy that we've accomplished our mission, and others are sad because the chemistry we've built will fall apart. And our ship now is too broken to sail. Collaboration is the process of two or more people working together to complete a task or achieve a goal. I wonder how our officers pulled it off. I mean, we sailed through fierce weather. We survived a dismassing and no one died or was horribly injured. We slept while others stood watch and we learned through the process of doing. In the end, we became bonded. We became friends. We were all just, you know, there for a job, but it became so much more. When I think about what our officers passed on to us, I come up with four key qualities. Leadership, mentorship, stewardship, and most importantly, friendship. After arriving in San Diego, Rose was a mess. So we had to bring her over to the naval dockyards so we could structurally rebuild her to transform her into HMS Surprise. After two months of a lot of structural work, Rose was put back in the water and we delivered her down to Ensenada so we could complete her transformation there aesthetically. And next you're gonna see a scene from uh, the trailer, Master and Commander. Now, I wrote this book because when I was a kid, I was inspired by some great books by authors like John Krakauer, wrote Into Thin Air, Sebastian Runger um, wrote uh, The Perfect Storm. And I wrote this book because I think it's important this day and age that we get that message, out, same message out to kids about creating their own adventure. So I hope that everyone in this room, if you enjoyed my presentation, will tell kids or anyone you think that needs a little bit of a motivation to go figure out how to make their own adventure. Maybe they might read a book like mine or, the, or John Krakow, Krakauer's book. Um, this concludes my presentation, and thank you again for having me. Uh, not only has Will um, written a great book, but he'll sign them for you. Imagine that. And so uh, come up afterwards. How much coin do we give away for getting one of these books here, Will? 28 US. Okay, good deal. Um, so let's see, Will. Um, crew accommodations then and now. You had 30 something that used to have 200. How did you sleep this time? Did you have your own berth? Did you hot bunk? And what about then? Um, yeah, on the rows today, we had to. We slept with uh, accommodations that met today's standards. So there were bunks, and they were small. They were kind of coffin-sized bunks, and you didn't really want a big bunk because with the amount of movement that would happen on the ship, a bigger bunk you have, it's, it's really not that beneficial. Uh, crew back in the day, they were allotted 16 inches of width and 6 feet of length. Now, we're talking about 200 men, so that's where the crew slept in hammocks because it was the only way that you were going to be able to fit that many crew members. Um, onto the ship and able to sleep. And then also, there would have been the division of watch intentionally where instead of doing a three watch system, they, they would have maybe preferably done a two watch system because that way you had less men sleeping at the same time down below on deck. Um, in regards to the question about the hot bunking, well, there is a little bit of that that you'll find in the book. So <laughs> we'll leave that for you. Speed of the vessel then and now. 
This is a three-masted, a cool sailing frigate in the middle 1800s. Uh, how fast was it going under sail in those days? How fast were you guys going under sail these days? I, th I think that we were both probably traveling about the same time uh, at the same hull speed. Uh, the replica rose did have a modified interior, or I'm um, sorry, uh, uh, the shape of the hull below the waterline was modified. And so she was a little bit more narrow. So maybe the, the rose back in the day would have sailed a little bit slower, but I think we were averaging between nine and 13 knots when we were underway. Now, those were a brand new set of engines and there really wasn't a lot of experience working with them. So we were so lucky because the Hollywood rep who was with us was actually a diesel mechanic also. And were it not for him being on board, I'm really, I'm dead serious. I think we might have ended up in a situation like the Bounty because we really needed the engines to weather that storm. Uh, through that storm, if you know, you saw, if you saw, we just had our staysail set. We had the engines going to kind of just help the, the boat stay just off the nose of the wind. Um, as a result of a fear of hydrolocking the engines again, we kept the engines running for the entire journey. Now I'm going to keep asking questions. But anybody who has a question, put your hand up. John Pector will bring a mic to you, and we'd love to have questions from the audience on any and all subjects. Um, talk about communications then and now. In those days, um, did they were they using signal flags, semaphore, and only when they got within sight of land? I can't imagine any other way they were communicating, but what do you know about that, and what about what communications did you guys have on your voyage? That's a great question, Ron. Back in the day, yeah, you, your forms of communication would have been signal flags and also uh, mail because that was really the best way. So there might have been – you might have produced a, a letter in duplicate or three times, and then if you had an interaction with another vessel somewhere out in the middle of the world, you would have handed one version of that letter off and then another to another version in hopes that one of those letters actually got to where they were supposed to go. But in regards to yeah, communicating other ships, they didn't have electricity, so there were no radios. Signal flags were really the only way that you were going to communicate, and there wasn't any sort of Morse code with any light communication as well. For us, fortunately, we did have modern amenities. We had a satellite phone on board, we had a radio, and there was constant communication with the shore crew as we were making the journey. Um, an email was sent out on a daily basis with an update about our conditions, which uh, after that storm and definitely the dismasting upset a lot of families. Uh, I got a few of <laughs> internal family emails forwarded to me when I was doing the research of the book. and. Let's just say a lot of bottles of vodka got drank by a lot of moms <laughs> late at night. Looking out at our audience and seeing uh, the young couple, uh, Keith and Linda Turner, uh, brings me to the next question. Talk to us about romance shipboard. Well, <laughs> well, I guess I'll 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 give it up a little bit, but you know, there's men and women on a boat, and when we're when you're, when you're living in a situation like that, there wasn't the, the women's quarters or the men's quarters. We all lived together, and that required decency, too. And I mean, living together means everyone's getting changed in the same space. The only thing you weren't sharing were the heads. There was a women's head and a men's head. And, yeah, eventually things are going to happen, and romances will spark, and uh, it'll work out for some people and not for others. I will – I'm going to go ahead and give you a little bit of the story, but I got lucky, and – Boy, I, 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 I'll tell you, probably one of the lowest lines of my life was there, there was this um, girl that, who was on the ship who I had known from the year before, and she was a French girl, and her bunk got soaked in the storm. I mean, just sopping wet, and I, 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 I said to her, I looked at the bunk, and I, I can't, I know, I'm not the kind of person that would have done, I guess now I would, um, and I, <laughs> I said to her, boy, that's a shame that your bunk is so wet, and you know what, we are on different watches, and that means, why don't you could share my bunk with me, but you'd only have to share it for four hours of the day, what do you think, and she looked at me and said, yes, and that, <laughs> That was a big surprise to me, but um, I, I can't believe it was that easy and that it worked. <laughs> <laughs> and that did not prompt a question from the audience. <laughs> so um, did you have radio communication? What were you using to communicate ashore? Were you using ship-to-shore radio? Did you have telephones, sat, sat uh, nav, whatever? 
Yeah, for communication, because we went so far offshore, we had satellite phones, and that was being used constantly. There was also um, a single sideband radio, I think, for checking uh, weather. There was a famous weather router in the Northeast called Norm, who did a lot of weather routing for as a free service. Um, I think he was also based in Michigan, which really kind of made it funny that he was the predominant weather router for the ocean, but mostly satellite phone. Question from Dave McEwen. Dave. Yeah, Will, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. Fascinating story. Uh, what has become of the ship Rose? Rose is now Surprise, and she is docked at the San Diego, at the Maritime Museum in San Diego. And she's a dockside attraction there, and it's wonderful to see her there. I'm a huge fan of the museum. It's, they have a great volunteer program, and they're able to operate some of their vessels. I don't know if Surprise is going to sail again because the priority of converting her from Rose to Surprise for the movie meant maybe not the best materials in conversion. So there would have to be so much work done to sort of undo the bad work to be able to really bring her back up to modern standards or Coast Guard standards. What about navigation tools? What were you using then and now? Well, I'd love to tell you that I know much about navigating on the ship, but as a deckhand, we really weren't privy to much navigation knowledge or information. I was there to be told what to do, and I was really a mule on the ship. Fortunately, because I was one of the ship's carpenters, it really elevated me from the other deckhands, and I got a, uh, a purview into Captain Bailey and the officers and what they were doing for navigating. But they were using charts. They definitely were using a GPS chart plotter, but still there was always backing up what you're doing. I think the start, start process might be dead reckoning and then verifying with your GPS coordinates. Back in the day, they were using sectants for navigating and they were using knot logs, which was um, how you uh, calibrated the ship's speed and charts that either were developed or through, um, by them or through experience. And so those of you uh, who don't know, uh, knots referred to the old term for measuring speed years and years ago, where you drop a line overboard with knots at a certain distance, and based on how far back that line got to the end of the boat, we're going that many knots of speed, five, six, seven, eight knots of speed. Um, yes, sir, question in the back of the room. Yeah, actually two questions. Um, now that you've let it be known that you had your engines going the whole time, I'm less impressed with your nine to 13 knots. Uh, so d did, you, um, did you have sail up? Did you continue to use the sails. Oh, absolutely. We used the sails as much as we could all the time on both coasts. We just kept the engines running. So the engines were in idle a good amount of time. We oh, weren't actually engaged. Yeah, okay. no, we just I'm being honest saying, yes, we had the engines running because we didn't want to hydrolock again. Okay. But the 9 to 12 was absolutely possible with the hull with that waterline length. And I'd say that we were probably even in the Caribbean Sea exceeding 15 to 16 when we were sort of when it was really puffing and we were cruising down the back of the waves um, under sail power that's awfully good um, the other question was you you mentioned your officers several times and with um, ad admiration so who who were the officers and what kind of training had they had and what kind of experience did they have so we had three so we had captain richard bailey who <clears throat> Um, he was a, a licensed uh, U.S. Coast Guard captain. I think he had an unlimited tonnage and an immense amount of experience. He gained his experience, uh, like most captains, doing sea time on a variety of vessels. And by the time I had gotten to the Rose, Captain Bailey had already, with the Rose, crossed the Atlantic twice. Um, in regards to our officers, our first mate was a man named Tony Arrow. Uh, our second mate was a man named... Andrew, uh, Andy Ellers, and our third mate was a woman named Christina Sobern. And all of them, just like Captain Bailey, got their experience through sailing various tall ships and rising as they continued to um, add to their licensing and, and, and experience. So historians in the room uh, will know that uh, this Yachting Speaker series was started in 1966 by Denny Jordan. And in the 90s, uh, I came to this post in 1990, uh, we uh, were hosting uh, Thursday's Child Skipper and Crew, who had just broken the 150-year-old record from Boston to San Francisco. And uh, when I asked 
um, Lars Bergstrom on the boat, one of the crew, I said, how's it feel to break this 150-year-old record? He said, well, you know, we were driving a, a carbon fiber boat with the spectrum lines and uh, eating freeze-dried food using sat-nav for navigation, and we just beat by a couple hours a square rigger hauling lumber. <laughs> He said we were actually quite humbled to be anywhere close to their record. <laughs> and so I got to say, Will, what an incredibly fun thing to do as a young guy. And then you decide to write a book about it. Talk to me, uh, us, about the whole process of deciding to record this with a book. Well, <clears throat> writing the book was an incredible adventure on its own because I, I had this version of what had happened to me. And fortunately, I want to let you know the, the framework of, of the book comes first from the ship's log. I reached out to Captain Bailey, who uh, actually was on his way to the West Coast to fill in on uh, the Californian, I think. And he brought out Rose's log and let me uh, take pictures of it. So I used that as the backbone for the book. Then with the footage that you saw, we had about three of us had camcorders on board. So we had recorded a total of eight hours of film footage. And a lot of my shipmates, when they found out that I wanted to write the book, everyone sent me pictures. Some people sent me their journals. So I had a lot of corroboration and cooperation. In addition to that, I reached out to as many shipmates as I could. Now, there were 30 of us on board. I think I only got in touch with 20 or 21. Some didn't want to be found. And again, like I said, I've got a bit of an acquired taste personality. Some didn't want to talk to me. <laughs> so I get it. I mean, probably the most awkward call was um, with that ex-girlfriend. We didn't, it didn't work out with us. And, you know, when you call someone up 15 years later and say, hey, I want to write a book about falling in love with you, that's a little, <laughs> that's a bit of a tough call. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, um, and she's an attorney now too so <laughs> so her response was let's just be clear Will this is your version of what happened it doesn't mean this is what happened <laughs> but um, it did it, I, I eventually did get her on board I realized that I was putting it off because I was two years into this when I finally said, oh, man, I still haven't called her for that interview. Because I did call everyone and interview them. Uh, what was very enlightening for me was I learned after my first couple interviews to actually wait to the last minute to call everyone or talk to them. Because it had been so long since we had done this together that we'd all changed as people. We'd grown up. Many of us had families. But we were encapsulated versions of ourselves then. So I really tried to approach the interviews with knowing that some of us hadn't talked to each other for that long and to kind of prod what, the, what we remembered about each other then before we talked about where we were today. So the, um, that was just uh, wonderful. And So um, did you make an outline, and how long did it take uh, to write the book? I did. I Well, no, <laughs> I didn't make an outline because I didn't know what I was doing. I never aspired to write a book. I, uh, I thought I have a seven-year-old daughter, and I, um, I hope, you know, I told you guys earlier about when I was a teenager, and I really hope that I, I thought to write this book for my daughter because I hope that when she is a teenager, she'll read an adventure story like this, and it will make her feel better about following her passion and what she's going to do with her life. Um, so, yeah, I had no idea what I was doing, and I just started, I, if anything, I'd say the ship's logbook was probably my outline, and I had to do everything backwards because after working on the book for two years, I started pitching the book to literary agents, and in order to do that, you need a book proposal, which is like an incredible business plan. And so that's where then I had to uh, create the outline. So I did things a little bit backwards than probably most authors would today. And uh, I can assure you the next book already has an outline underway. <laughs> so what was your process? Would you get up in the morning and write from 9 until noon? Or when, when did you set a time aside to be writing? Well, for me, the best time to write is my daughter goes to bed at 8 o'clock. I have a vodka martini or two. And then when my wife goes to bed, I'd start writing. And I'd work probably till about midnight or 2 in the morning every night. And then if I could in the morning I'd, before taking her to school, I'd get 15 minutes in here or there. But um, I'm not a big sleeper, so that schedule worked really well for me and helped me maintain my day job.
So I also want to, uh, oh, there's a question by Shelly Sky. I was just going to introduce her. Okay. Uh, I want to also say that um, we think, uh, on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, that it's a great asset of our club to have the speaking series, and we like other yacht clubs have speakers as well. So we're sharing all of our speakers with the other yacht clubs in the area, San Francisco, Sausalito, and Corinthian. And we want to all welcome those members to come to our club and our members to go to their clubs. We're in a small yachting community. We should all recognize each other as friends with a similar addiction, and we should take sympathy on each other. We're all into yachting, and it's uh, clearly a silly thing to be doing. So we should have compassion for each other. That should be bigger than our rivalries. And so with that, I want to introduce the, the chairman of the speaker series at Corinthian, Shelly Skye. Shelly, welcome. Thank you. I don't want to talk about me, but I want to thank Ron very much for inviting me today because when I attend a speaker here, I can just pay attention. And when I'm hosting a speaker at the Corinthian, I'm all worried about sound and are there going to be questions and things like that. So today is wonderful for me. Um, and I do have a question. And, but also thank you, Ron, because I totally agree about cooperation among the clubs. It's really fun. I, I have been to many of these, so I'm here, present at lunch, so I'm really happy to be back. Thank you. So my question is very simple for Will, which is, um, sorry, Will is coming to the Corinthian tomorrow night in case you know anybody who wants to come tomorrow night. It's totally open. My question is very simple but fun. Will... Did you or any of the other crew appear in the movies? Well, a lot of crew members did appear in the movie. Um, I was cast, and I had a, a set job for it, but I had I felt that I had just done the real thing, and I didn't want to make a movie about sailing. I wanted to keep doing the real thing, so I got offered a great job back east, and I decided to leave the ship. But a num I'd say two-thirds of the crew ended up staying on for the filming, and... It's really funny to say, even though they stayed on, not everyone was able to be cast because they wanted weird-looking people. If that was Peter Weir really wanted everyone to look differently. And unfortunately, that meant that the girls, when they put beards on, really <laughs> fit the bill. So, so I see more of the girls in the scenes with beards than actually any of the guys that we sailed with. <laughs> So let's see, uh, as a closing, I want to remind everybody that on uh, May 3rd, Russell Coots, uh, Sir Russell Coots, actually, as you know, he's uh, commander, order of the British Empire. And then uh, 24th, our Dave McEwen, not yet a sir. Uh, and then uh, Gary Jobson on June the 7th will be here. Now, uh, Will, I want to buy a book, so I just can buy a book and you can write some uh, uh, phony things on the front of it about meeting me and all that sort of stuff, right? Everybody else is welcome to come up and buy a book as well. And let's uh, say thank you to our guest, Will Saffron. Thank you so much, buddy. Much, much fun. Terrific. Great talk. And with, and with that, we adjourn a Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.